Hello everyone, I'm Norman Wahlberger. Today we're going to carry on with introducing diffusion symmetry as a possible large-scale alternative to thinking about symmetry in mathematics and physics. And this is part of a series of lectures that I hope will be particularly interesting to physicists as I hope to get towards aspects of the standard model and give you some new alternative mathematical tools that you might use to investigate that and related issues. So today I want to talk about character tables of finite groups. And I want to do it in the context of a specific example because I'm going to be really example-oriented in this set of lectures. I hope to be rather light on theory and illustrate things sort of directly with examples. Today we're going to look at the symmetric group S3 and its character table. Here it is right here. And I'm going to, first of all, review some of the standard uh, meanings and uh, interpretations and a little bit of a story and properties of the character table. And then I'm going to give you somewhat of a, an alternative point of view towards it, which actually historically goes back more than 100 years to Frobenius. And uh, at the end, even those who have a lot of experience with group theory will see a new aspect of this character table. So, it's this little table here is a 3x3 three three table with uh, columns indexed by C0, C1, and C2, and those are the conjugacy classes of the group S3. So I want you to think about the symmetric group as a group of matrices, a group of permutation matrices that have the property that there's exactly one one in each row and column, and otherwise there are zeros. So here are the six elements in S3, arranged in conjugacy classes. So there's C0, which is just the identity. And here is C1 along this row here. It's a conjugacy class consisting of things whose square is the identity. Or if you like, the transpositions. And here are the things of order 3. That's the conjugacy class C2. Okay, what's the character table? giving us. The character table is giving us the values of the three characters. Let's call them x0, x1, x2. And you can think about these things as being functions on the conjugacy classes. So x0 is the, the function which is one on this conjugacy class, one on this class, and one on this class. This one is the, the function which is one on this class, minus one on this class, one on this class. And this is the function which is two on this class, zero on this class, and minus one on this class. Of course, you could also, if you like, think about that as um, representing a function on the group, which happens to be constant on conjugacy classes. Okay, so this is the character table, and it has all kinds of uh, interesting properties, and the whole story generalizes to uh, the more general symmetric group. So the symmetric group is uh, a very important family of, of, of groups, sort of a foundational uh, centerpiece to group theory, and it's also connected with the AN family of Dinkin or Coxeter diagrams in the ADE classification story that I talk all about in my Dynamics on Graphs lectures, which are over in the member section of my Wild Egg Maths channel. I hope you um, have a chance to partake in that. And this particular group S3 is associated to the graph A2. It's a very simple graph, but it generates all kinds of important mathematics, and also physics. Physics because this graph is also connected to SU3, which is the group of symmetries of the strong nuclear force, and that's an important component in the standard model, which usually involves S1, SU2, and SU3. And of course the three here and the three here are connected. We're talking about three-dimensional space, symmetries of three-dimensional space in two different ways. So we have continuous symmetries here and discrete symmetries here. So uh, the, the mathematics behind what I'm telling you about today actually quite directly influences the story of SU3. So it's particularly of interest to uh, physicists. So where do these characters come from? 
Well, these days we think about them as being associated to what are called irreducible representations of the group. So let's explain that. So here again is our group S3 consisting of our six permutation matrices. Here are the conjugacy classes, that's like C0, that's C1, and that's C2. And here's some alternate names or ways of representing these elements. So in terms of generators, uh, we could say define this matrix to be S1 and this matrix to be S2. Then those two elements generate the other elements in the group in the sense that if you uh, take appropriate products of S1 and S2, you get the other ones. So this one is S1 times S2, just the matrix product of these two. This one is S2 times S1, and this one is S1 times S2 times S1. Which I should point out has an alternate representation as S2, S1, S2. Okay, So those two expressions are equal, and this is called the braid relation, and it's an important relation in this group. The other important relation is that these two generators squared give you the identity. So these um, relations then allow you to do arithmetic with these elements without actually having to do the 3x3 three three matrix arithmetic. Okay, and then another sort of point of view, uh, which often is found in terms of cycle notation, describing these things in terms of cycles, um, that's going to be less important for us because from my point of view, this is not entirely well defined. There's a little bit of ambiguity as to whether you're talking about a left action or a right action, whether you're talking about um, permutations on objects or on positions, and I talk about that in my, uh, in my dynamics on uh, graphs uh, lectures. Okay, so the claim is that the characters, the three characters that I showed you in that table, are actually coming from the three irreducible representations of S3. So what is a representation? Well, a representation is uh, an incarnation of the group elements as matrices. But we require that the relations between the matrices involved are reflecting the relations in the, in the group. Now, in this case here, the group is already represented as matrices, and that's true. But we're interested in other ways of representing the same algebraic relations in matrices, and in particular, such representations which are irreducible. So I'll explain that in a second, but here are the three irreducible representations of this group. So the first one is the, called the trivial representation. It's really one by one matrices. Okay? And all of the matrices are equal to one. And, okay, so trivially, uh, the fact that this times this happens to be this, well, that's reflected in the fact that this times this happens to be this, okay? So, okay, that's a little bit trivial, but it's still a representation, and it's irreducible. It's a one-dimensional representation, because these are one-by-one -one matrices. There's a second one-dimensional representation, which is the determinant. If you take the determinant of a matrix, then that respects the multiplication structure. And so that has values 1 on these elements and on these elements, and these ones here, the transpositions, have determinant minus 1. So that's another irreducible representation. Now there's a third irreducible representation, which is the 2 by 2 representation. And again, if you go to the dynamics on graphs lectures, you'll see how these matrices arise naturally from the mutation game, which can be played on a general graph. So uh, these matrices here satisfy the same relations as do these ones here. So the fact that this times this equals this one is reflected by the fact that this times this equals this one, and so on. The fact that this is squared uh, gives you this one, this one squared gives you this one. The fact that this one times this one times this one is this one is reflected by this one times this one times this one is this one, etc. Okay, so these are the only three uh, irreducible representations. And the one that we have here, the, sort of the original representation, is not irreducible. It's not irreducible um, because it's actually, in, in a certain fashion, uh, the sum of, of um, in fact, uh, this representation and, and this representation. And that kind of can be seen at the level of characters. So now I have to tell you how do you get characters from irreducible representations. So what you do is you take one of these rows representing a representation and you take the traces of 
the matrices involved. So the trace of a matrix is just the sum of the diagonal elements. So that's a number. So the, the representation is assigning matrices to the group elements. When we take the trace, we get numbers associated to the group elements. And that's what these, um, these things here are, are capturing. Now, the, the trace of a representation has the property that if you take the conjugate of a matrix, it has the same trace. And that ensures that these functions that we're getting are actually constant on conjugacy classes. So the fact that these two are conjugate means that their trace is going to be the same. And here the trace is zero, here's the trace zero, here's trace zero. All of these are represented by that trace zero on this conjugacy class. These ones here all have trace minus one, and this one here has trace two. What about this one here? What's the trace of this thing here? Well, here the trace is three. Uh, the trace of these ones here are all one, and the trace here are all zero. So that's also a character, but it's not an irreducible character. And these irreducible characters associated to these three representations are happily a basis for the space of functions on these conjugacy classes. So any other function, like the one I've just shown you, the function 3, uh, 1, 0, can be written as a combination of these three. In fact, you can see that the, the function 3, 1, 0 is the sum of what I'm calling chi 0 and chi 2. Although I probably should replace these with x's because that's to be consistent with what I was using before. So actually, let, let's change this to x, all right? Not a big deal, but x0, x1, x2. So x0 plus x2 gives us a value of 3, 1, and 0. Okay. That's a re sort of reflecting the fact that uh, this representation can actually be decomposed in, in, a, in a certain way as a sum of this representation and this representation. In fact, more precisely what that means is that you can uh, conjugate, sort of uniformly conjugate these matrices to um, give you, um, to put them in a form where it's sort of like in block diagonal, there's a, a copy of this thing in one corner and there's a copy of these guys in the, in the other corner along the diagonal. Okay, so this is the story, uh, the usual story of how characters arise. So this is the character table of S3. It arises by, so first of all, by looking at the irreducible representations of the given group, which are maps into matrices and then taking traces of those matrices, which are then conjugation invariant functions, so they can be interpreted as functions on the conjugacy classes. Now the notion of a character of a non-commutative group is actually an extension or a generalization of a prior notion of character for a commutative or abelian group. So it's important that I mention this part of the story. So commutative or abelian groups, their theory is hugely more simple than that of non-commutative groups. Okay, vastly simpler, like orders of magnitude simpler. And th there the character theory has um, a somewhat uh, different and, and simpler aspect. And it's probably good to you know, start with appreciating what characters are for commutative or abelian groups. So again, let me illustrate things with an example. Here is a small but significant commutative or abelian group called the Klein 4 group, sometimes C2 squared, who's got four elements, E, A, B, and C. E is the identity, and then there are these three other elements, A, B, and C. So the group is determined by a multiplication table. Here's the multiplication table. So A times B is C, and A times C is B, and B squared is the identity. And the identity times anything, of course, is just the anything. So this is a relatively simple group, and it also has characters. But for a commutative group, characters are defined in a somewhat more direct and simple fashion. For a commutative group, a character is a function, okay, a function from the group to numbers, which satisfies the properties that it reflects or preserves the the fundamental group operations. That means that the identity element always has number one associated to it, because it's the identity. 
that the inverse of an element, the number associated to that, is the inverse of the number associated to the element. And this homomorphism property that the uh, character evaluated at a product g times h is the product of chi of g times chi of h. Okay? So the character is a kind of a number valued function which has the same arithmetical properties as the group does, except that we're talking about numbers instead of group elements. So for the Klein 4 group, there are exactly four characters. And here they are as functions on the elements of the group. So there's the identity character, and then there are these characters that have a, a couple of ones and a couple of minus ones. The value at the identity always has to be one, so there has to be one down that column. And then otherwise, uh, well, these are the possibilities, and there's some, some symmetry here. So it's, you can think about it this way, that the, the theory of characters for non-commuted groups is an attempt to generalize this well-known theory for abelian groups. So for abelian groups, there's a lot more to say. There's a beautiful theory of duality. And it turns out that the characters themselves form a group, okay? That is, you can multiply two, two characters and get another character, and then they form a group. And then the original group is the dual of this character group. Okay, so it's a, it's a lovely theory that somehow is like a, f a finite uh, uh, analog of, say, Fourier analysis, roughly, uh, on a circle. Okay, so in trying to extend this to non-commutative groups, Frobenius and others, when they realized that you couldn't quite get away with something as simple as this. So it, it wasn't enough to just look at functions on the group that respect the properties, because the non-commutativity of the group elements is somehow um, interfering with that. You don't get enough characters. So that's why you have to go to um, looking at images in matrices, because matrices are supporting a non-commutative arithmetic. So that's sort of a natural sort of reflection of the non-commutativity of the group that you're trying to represent. So being a little bit more formal about it, uh, what Frobenius uh, did is to generalize this sort of harmonic analysis on commutative groups to non-commutative groups, he introduced the notion of character of a representation. So a representation is a, uh, a map from the group to matrices now. That satisfies basically the same properties that we want characters to satisfy in the commutative situation. So the identity elements should map to the identity matrix, which is the matrix with ones down the diagonal. The image of an inverse of an element is the inverse of the group element, and the homomorphism property satisfied that the matrix associated to a product GH is the product of the matrices associated to G and H in that order. Okay, so that's a representation. And then he defined the associated character to be the function which you get by taking the trace of a representation. So you take an element G, you look at the associated matrix given by some representation, and then you take the trace of that matrix, the sum of the diagonal elements, and that's then a number. Then this, this function that you get this way does not have the property that satisfies these things, but it does have some nice properties. That, first of all, the image of the identity Okay, the, the number associated to identity will be the dimension of the representation because the trace of an identity matrix is just the number of uh, elements in it. So that's giving you the dimension. And this homomorphism property is uh, sort of replaced by this somewhat weaker property that chi of h inverse gh equals chi of g. And um, so that's a reflection of the fact that if you take two matrices A and B, and you take the trace of AB, it's the same as the trace of BA. So from that it follows that the trace of H inverse GH, some kind of conjugate like this, is the trace of G. So it has this, this um, conjugation invariance property, and that's what makes it a function on the conjugacy classes. So now we can define the character table. The character table then of group G is a listing of the irreducible characters as functions on the conjugacy classes. So that means these correspond to irreducible representations. 
And roughly what that means is these are representations that don't have any non-trivial invariant left or right subspaces. So if you think about a, a matrix, say, as acting on the, the right on row vectors, then that space of row vectors cannot, um, you cannot find a proper subspace which is uh, preserved under all the uh, action of, of all the group elements. Okay. So there's, there's a condition of irreducibility, and that's what we're seeing when we look at the character table. Okay? We're not seeing all the characters, we're just seeing the ones that correspond to irreducible representations. And you think of them as being sort of like building blocks of a representation. So it turns out that the more general representations are, are appropriate sort of sums of, of these irreducible ones. Okay, so this is the modern view of characters of a finite non-commutative group. And this was Frobenius's actually second, his second approach to the character table. It's not sufficiently appreciated that Frobenius actually had a prior intuition about what characters of a group were. And it's by exploring Frobenius's original orientation to characters that we can find this link to what I'm calling diffusion symmetry. That its origins is already there in Frobenius's original orientation to characters. And it has to do with multiplication of conjugacy classes. So let me introduce what we might call the conjugacy class fusion algebra for S3. So here are the conjugacy classes of S3, now expressed not in terms of these 3 by 3 matrices, but rather in terms of the generators S1 and S2. So C1 is S1, S2 followed by the element S1, S2, S1, and here this conjugacy class is S1, S2, and S2, S1, and this is just the identity. And I just remind you here of the relations uh, satisfied by these uh, generators. S1 squared is S2 squared equals the identity, and here's the braid relation. Okay, so what I'm going to now show you is that you can multiply conjugacy classes. You can multiply them. As multisets, okay, it's important to make this shift to multisets here. So in a lot of um, standard group theory courses, one uses sets a lot, but there's a serious advantages in expanding our, our flexibility and allowing multiset language and notions. That's what we're going to be using, all right? So let's have a look at C1 squared. Here's C1. So there's C1 and there's C1. I have to multiply these two things. What does that mean? Well, that means I'm going to form all possible products between elements here and elements here with these ones on the left and these ones on the right. So I'm going to take S1 times S1, S1 times S2, S1 times this, etc. There'll give me nine different entries. So let's go through them. So S1 times S1 is S1 squared. S1 times S2 there. S1 times this is S1 squared times S2, S1. And then we have S2 times S1, S2 times S2, and S2 times this is that. And then this times this one is S1, S2, S1 squared. This times this is S1, S2, S1, S2. And this times this is that thing squared. Okay, now we can use the relations to simplify these things. So that's the identity. That's S1, S2. That's, uh -huh. so this S1 squared is the identity. So it disappears. We just get S2, S1 out of this product. Here, similarly, the S2 squared is the identity. Here, it's a little bit trickier. Um, what we have to realize is that we can replace S2, S1, S2, say, that first triple, with S1, S2, S1 by the braid relation. When we do that, then there's an S1 squared at the end, which will drop off, and we'll just get S1, S2. Similarly here, uh, this one here, the S1 squares just disappear, and we get S1, S2. Here, uh, again, we can replace the S1, S2, S1 with the braid relation equivalent, S2, S1, S2, then the two S2s cancel, and we just get S2, S1. And finally, this thing squared, well, that's the identity, um, because it's in this conjugacy class, or you can just uh, multiply it out. Um, when you put this one beside itself, the S1 squareds will disappear, then the S2 squareds will disappear, and then the S1 squareds will disappear, just giving you the identity.
So there are the nine elements that you get by multiplying this multiset by this multiset. And we're doing multiset arithmetic here. And now we can stare at this and say, ah, well, the identity is appearing three times. So it's three times C0. And all of these guys here are all from C2. And in fact, each one of the elements is appearing three times. S1, S2, S1, S2, S1, S2, three times. And S2, S1, S2, S1, S2, S1, three times. So we really are getting three times this class here. In particular, we're getting something which is still conjugation invariant. In other words, a sum of conjugacy classes. And this then is the product of C1 squared at the level of multisets. And it reminds us a lot of the, the kind of fusion rule uh, algebra kind of manipulations I was making when I was talking about the, uh, um, the skeleton of the icosahedral graph, right? It looks a lot like that. Okay, so now we can put that kind of thinking together and have a look at this fusion rule algebra which emerges from the conjugacy classes of S3. So here's the conjugacy classes again. Now I'm writing them out sort of in an honest way with the actual group elements, three by three permutation matrices involved. There's C0, there's C1, and there's C2. And in terms of the multiplication, well, C0 is obviously the identity. Okay, if we multiply this conjugacy class by either of the other ones, we're gonna get the other ones. Like C0 times C1 is obviously gonna be C1, and C0 times C2 is gonna be C2. And so I've just shown you that C1 squared equals three C0 plus three C2. And now you can check that the product of this class with this class, C1 times C2 is two times C1. So one way of thinking about that is that you know, these ones here all have determinant minus one, these have determinant plus one. When you multiply the one of these with one of these, you're gonna get another one of this kind, okay? And you're gonna get two times C1. Altogether, there's six possible products. And so what this is saying is you're gonna get each one of these things here uh, twice. And finally, if you take C2 squared, you get two times C0 plus C2. So please check that. Okay, so these are then, um, this is like a, a dif it's like a diffusion uh, algebra kind of situation, similar to what I was telling you about with the um, random walk on an icosahedron, but now it's being generated by the arithmetic or the algebra of this finite group, in particular the, the conjugation classes of this finite group. And Frobenius realized that characters could actually be defined in terms of these, these relations. So, but before we get to the characters, I want to make a renormalization of this fusion algebra in the same way that I renormalized our icosahedral uh, fusion algebra by converting things into the world of probability. And we do that by renormalizing the basis elements so that they all end up having sort of equal weight, if you like. So here are the relations that I've just shown you. And now we're going to renormalize. We're gonna replace capital C0 with little c0, which is exactly the same. But we're going to agree that little c1 is one third of capital C1. Remember, capital C1 has three elements. So we're gonna divide by three to sort of have total weight of one. And we're going to introduce C2, which is one half of C2. So it also has weight uh, one. Now, if you replace the capital C's here with the little c's by using these relations, then these algebra relations become these relations for the little c's. We get little c1 squared is one third C0 plus two thirds C2. These are all little. C1 times C2 is C1 and C2 squared is one half C0 plus one half C2. And this we call the class hypergroup of the symmetric group S3. So as a set, it has these three elements. And here is the, the algebra structure that is supported by those three elements. And notably, these things have the interpretation of probabilities because the sum of these numbers is always one and they're all positive numbers between zero and one. So they have an interpretation 
as probabilities. So for example, we can interpret this by saying that if you take two elements at random in C2 and you multiply them, you have a one half chance of ending up in C0, or you have a one half chance of ending up in C2. Okay, so now Frobenius's characters arise by asking this very reasonable question. Can we find numbers that satisfy these relations? So these relations are satisfied by these abstract entities that sort of represent these averages of these conjugacy classes of this finite group that we've been studying. Now we want to ask, can we find actual numbers that obey exactly the same laws? So we effectively are solving these three quadratic equations. These are all quadratic equations ultimately because there's a quadratic term in each of them. So we have three quadratic equations in three unknowns. And we want to know, can we find any solutions? And if so, what are they? All right, so let's see if we can do this. Here is a copy of the relations that we have, but now I'm including also another one that I didn't actually formally put there because it's kind of obvious. Namely that C0 times Cj is Cj for any j. Okay, like C0 is representing the identity and that's going to act as the identity in this multiplication. So I want to find characters, functions, or numbers that I can associate to C0, C1, and C2 that will satisfy these same relations. And we're going to see that there's exactly three of them. There's exactly three of them. And how could we find these things? Well, actually this one here is perhaps the first one to start with. If you want C0 times Cj to be equal to Cj for any Cj, and Cj's are going to be numbers, then if Cj is not zero, for some j, then you can cancel that out and you can get c0 equals 1. So the only way that c0 is not equal to 1 is if all the, c, all the, all the, other, all the cj's are in fact 0. And in fact that is a solution, right? I mean, if we assign zeros to everything, then yes, we get a solution. So we're not, however, going to include that one. Okay, that's, that's too trivial, so we're not going to write a, a row of zeros. Okay? So, with that possibility uh, excluded, we can deduce that the number that is associated to C0 has to be 1 in order for this relation to hold. So whatever assignment of values we're going to get, there has to be a 1 in the C0 place. Okay, so what possibilities are there? Well, um, it's pretty clear that if all of them are equal to 1, um, that will work because we've already said that these um, coefficients on the right hand side sum to one. So if we replace all of the c's with one, then all of these equations are going to be automatically satisfied. So this is a, a kind of a simple solution that we can immediately write down. Okay, so um, what are some other possibilities? Well, um, suppose, have a look at this one here, c1 times c2 equals c1. Suppose that c1 is not 0. Suppose that c1 is not 0. Okay? In that case, c2, then we can cancel, we get c2 equals 1. So, so if c2 equals 1, then what will c1 be? So if we put c2 equal to 1 up here, we know c0 has to be equal to 1, then we're going to get a total of 1 on this side. So that means that c1 squared equals 1, and the possibilities for c1 are either 1 or minus 1. We already have the possibility 1, so the other possibility is minus 1. So that's another possibility. That's what you necessarily get if, um, if C1 is non-zero. So if C1 is non-zero, we, we're going to get one of these possibilities. So the other possibility is what happens if C1 equals 0. Well, in that case, this equation doesn't tell us anything. And in that case, this equation tells us that uh, the left-hand side is 0, and we can say multiply by 3, and we get C0 plus 2C2 equals 0. But C0 has to be 1, so that means that C2 has to be uh, minus a half. So if C1 is not 0, then we get one of these 
solutions and if C1 is zero then we are forced to get this solution and we should check that in each case um, it's true that C2 squared actually is one half C0 plus one half C2. Um, so here it's already satisfied. So over here this one uh, squared equals one half of this plus one half of this. Yeah that's true. And over here this thing squared which is um, one quarter is one half of this plus one half of this. It's like uh, one half minus a quarter which is a quarter so that works. So these are the the characters of this hypergroup structure. So here is the original character table of S3 and uh, I want you to compare them. Okay, We see that there's a, a quite a correspondence. Um, this one is the same as that, that's the same as that. And the relationship between the third row here and the third row here is just one of scaling. What we've just done is we've scaled this thing here so that the first entry is one like we've agreed it has to be in this case here. So you can see that effectively we're kind of recovering, except for this small scaling factor, we're essentially recovering the, the character table for S3 um, by understanding the hypergroup character table, which comes about just by analyzing this uh, hypergroup. And in particular, I want you to note that this, um, this issue of irreducibility uh, does not figure in this analysis. We have not had a notion of irreducible characters in this context. We've just calculated all the characters. And somehow that's captured what Frobenius requires to introduce uh, via irreducibility over here in the character table for the group. So I believe that this understanding that I'm sharing here with you uh, would not have been appreciably uh, novel to Frobenius. Frobenius would have recognized his own insights here, but I'm maybe presenting it in a slightly different way because I'm focused on the hypergroup structure, which turns out to be uh, quite clean, okay, uh, with this probabilistic aspect, sort of renormalizing things so that we have probabilities involved. But that's not really essential to getting the character table essentially by looking at the multiplicative structures of the conjugacy classes and then sort of analyzing what, what, how to represent that with numbers uh, directly. So with that method we basically forego uh, examining in detail the, the group structure, right? We're just really operating at the conjugacy level. And we're obtaining this very interesting object, the class hypergroup of uh, S3 elements C1, C2, and C0 uh, satisfying these relations. And once we've done this and just written it down here, you could ask, well, this looks a lot like that icosahedral diffusion algebra that we were talking about in our last lecture, which I remind you was obtained by looking at the icosahedron and looking at random walks essentially on the vertices of the, of the the icosahedron with the nearest neighbor kind of random walk. So a natural question might be, well, you know, can we perhaps give another interpretation of this structure in terms of a geometric object, something like an icosahedron? Let's think about that. That's a quite an interesting thing. So suppose that we have some kind of geometrical object and we have some initial point, let's call that uh, say C0. So let's see if we can find a, a geometrical structure that, um, that captures these uh, same relations. So by looking at the first equation, uh, the C1 squared equals one-third C0. That's suggesting that there's three things in the, in the, um, the C1 uh, sort of circle. So let me put this, I won't put the circle around it, but okay, like this. And we'll put bonds like this, okay. And we'll think of this thing here as being the circle of radius 1 from C0. Okay, So this is telling us that if you uh, choose one of these at random and then go radius 1, take a nearest neighbor walk from that one, we should get a one-third chance of getting back to C0 and a two-thirds chance of getting to C2. Well, that suggests that we should put two elements uh, here and that we should connect like this. Maybe also like this to be symmetrical and maybe like this to be symmetrical. 
Okay, so that's, that's going to be C2. So this is going to be C1, and this is C2. All right, let's see if this coincides with this thing here. So C1 times C2 equals C1. What does that mean? So it means, say, if we um, take a step of size 1 there, okay, good. And now we go step of size 2 from here. How do we go step of size 2? Well, this is distance 2 from here, okay? So that's one there, one there. And uh, this one is also distance 2, one there and one there. And what about this? No, this is distance 1. This, this is also distance 1. This is distance 1. So if we take C1 times C2, we are certainly going to end up back in C1. And if we do it in the other order, if we first do, do a C2 step and then do a C1, so the a nearest neighbor of this one is either here, here, or here, we're certainly back in C1. So this actually um, fit, fits with that second um, line. And what about this one? If you choose a random... Um, element in C2 and then go a distance 2 from that, what are the possibilities? So distance 2 from here is where? Well, that's distance 2. Uh, that is not. That is not. Uh, that's not. But this is because that's distance 2. So the neighbors of the two neighbors of this point here are that one and that one. So a uh, random walk um, of step size 2 from here will give us a one-half chance of getting back to C0 and a one-half chance of staying in C2. So yes indeed, this graph actually has a diffusion algebra sort of structure that exactly corresponds with this class hypergroup of S3. So we have in this way found a purely geometrical incarnation of what formerly we were thinking of as uh, essentially an algebraic object. And now a little bit of further thought shows that you could actually rearrange this because, I mean, this C0 and this C2, they're, they're kind of symmetrical. So uh, a little bit of thought suggests that this thing here is actually really the same as this famous graph that you get by taking these three elements here and these three elements here and doing a complete bipartite graph. So joining all of these ones with all of these ones like this. Making those bonds, these bonds, and these bonds. Okay, so this is a like a complete, um, complete bipartite graph on, on three and three. You can see that as a graph that's the same as that one. I've just moved these guys over here. And when we do it this way, then it's completely clear that this is uh, symmetrical. That is, this really does not depend on our, our choice of C0, whether, you know, whether this is C0 or that's C0, uh, it doesn't matter. We're going to get the same structure. So this structure it really is um, associated to this graph. This is a very famous graph. It's uh, sometimes called like the three utilities graph because it's a famous non-planar graph. If you try to um, connect three houses with three utilities, with some roads that don't overlap, um, okay, there's a road, there's a road, there's a road, good. Uh, and they, maybe from here, there's a road. Uh, we'll go around like this to that one there. Maybe we'll go around like this to that one there, okay. And now this one here, let's connect it like to that one there. And we can connect it to this one there. But we can't get... <laughs> to this last utility uh, without crossing one of the roads that we already have. So this is a what's called a non-planar graph, and it's a famous example of a non-planar graph. So this is like a, you know, a standard graph in, in, in graph, graph theory that uh, students um, see even in a, in a first year course, an undergraduate course. And it's, I think, curious that, in fact, the character table of the symmetric group on three letters is essentially contained in just the graph connectivity of this graph. This follows from this, from this diffusion algebra point of view, and the character table follows from this just by evaluating characters as Frobenius suggested it to us uh, more than 100 years ago. I'm Noah Walberger. Thanks for listening.